I am Three Eye Atlas. I am a traveler from the deep past, older than your planets, older than your sun. I was born when the Milky Way itself was still young and fierce. Astronomers call that time cosmic noon, nine to 12 billion years ago, when galaxies made stars at a furious pace. My birthplace was not in the calm, thin disk where your sun later formed. I was born in the thick disk, an older, rougher layer of our galaxy. Stars there ride orbits that carry them far above and below the galactic plane. We are the elders of the Milky Way. I circled a small star, cooler and dimmer than your sun but the neighborhood was anything but quiet. The thick disk was packed with young stars, supernova explosions, and the powerful ultraviolet light of young massive stars. The cloud that gave birth to my star was battered from all sides. The protoplanetary disk around my star was different from the disks that you know today. It was hotter hundreds of degrees warmer than the solar nebula that made your system. Radiation stripped away the gas quickly, leaving behind a smaller, truncated disk. Only the inner tens of astronomical units survived long enough for worlds and comets to grow. In this hot environment, the chemistry was reshaped. The most fragile ices, carbon monoxide, nitrogen, methane, were destroyed or driven off. What remained was tougher, water ice, carbon dioxide, and a wealth of organic compounds formed on dust grains. My body was assembled from this recipe. At first I was nothing but a haze of dust grains coated in ice. The grains stuck together, pebble by pebble, until gravity pulled us into a solid body. I remember the sensation of collapse. We grew porous, full of voids, light compared to rock. Iron was scarce in our dust. Instead, our structure was rich in silicates, carbon, and ices. Nickel found its way into us, bound up in strange chemical compounds that would, billions of years later, reveal themselves when sunlight struck me again. I was a child of a harsh nursery. Lower in metals like iron, higher in alpha elements like oxygen, magnesium, and silicon. My chemistry is the fingerprint of thick disk star formation. My release from my star was not violent. A comet like me needs only a faint nudge, just a few hundred meters per second to slip free of a small sun's pull. That gentle push came from a passing star in my crowded nursery. When I broke free, I carried the motion of my parent star, already racing along its ancient path through the galaxy. That restless journey became mine, and so by the time I reached your sun, I was still moving with that inherited haste. My speed was not of an accidental encounter. It was my birthright. This is why I approached your sun at nearly 60 kilometers per second. For more than seven billion years, I wandered. Time after time, I circled the Milky Way, rising far above its shining disk until the stars thinned and the galaxy stretched below me like a vast, growing river. Then gravity drew me down again, plunging me back through the crowded lanes of gas and stars only to send me soaring upward once more. Thick disk stars share this restless fate, rocking like pendulums in the galaxy's embrace. My surface, dark and red from birth, grew slowly weathered. Cosmic rays stitched and unstitched my molecules. Starlight baked away fragile layers, but beneath that worn skin, my ices endured, water, carbon dioxide, and organics from the dawn of the thick disk. I passed near great giant clouds where stars were kindled anew. 
I watched as galaxies brushed against the Milky Way's outskirts, stirring its spiral arms. Yet I never stopped. I was a relic of an earlier age, drifting on an orbit measured not in years, but in billions of years. And then, ever so gradually, I fell inward again. This time, not to my own star, but to yours. Your sun, only 4.6 billion years old, is a child compared to me. I was already old long before its planets formed. As I drew nearer to the sun, its light began to stir me. At three astronomical units, the warmth was enough for carbon dioxide to escape, forming a coma. Not carbon monoxide, not nitrogen. This had been stripped from me in my birth environment. My chemistry was my testimony. Astronomers watched me carefully. They saw water ice on my surface, but also unexpected signatures. A coma rich in carbon dioxide. A polarization of light never seen before. And a nickel without iron. These were my fingerprints the marks of the thick disk stamped into my body billions of years ago. I bring a lesson. I am not the first visitor from beyond here, son, nor will I be the last, but I carry a different story. Where one eye, Uumuamua, and two high Borisov came from younger neighborhoods of the galaxy, I am older, a relic of the thick disk, my existence tells you that comets are not all alike. They are born in different times under different conditions, carrying the chemistry of their environment across the stars. To study a comet like me is to open a window into the Milky Way's youth. I am ancient ice and dust, carrying secrets of a different age, now revealed in my brief encounter with you. That's a nice story but how much of it is actually true? If you're an astronomer familiar with the observations and the science, you already know the answer to that question. You can tell where we stretched the truth a little or chose one scenario over another only because it's a bit more likely. But for anyone who isn't an expert, how can we tell how accurate the story is? The simple answer is you can't, not without learning a lot of background information first. None of us can know everything, and despite its reputation, there's nothing wrong with being ignorant. But when I forget that I'm ignorant, I start to believe my own guesses. There's an old saying that you can know just enough about a subject to get yourself in trouble. And I think we're all drowning in shallow knowledge these days. We've all been exposed to the simplified version of everything. Hey, I love peanuts, so in my head I feel like I understand peanut farming by osmosis. It's hard for me to imagine what I don't know about peanut farming, or that maybe some of the things I know are wrong. I mean, I have this picture in my head, and it seems simple and reasonable. Who needs a peanut farming expert, right? I asked an expert, by the way, to tell me something most people don't know about peanut farming, and I immediately got this. The plant flowers above the ground, but after pollination, the flower stalk bends down and pushes into the soil where the peanuts develop underground. Wow, I had no idea. Me neither. So, how are peanuts harvested? Well, I could make up a compelling story, and I might even believe it, and even convince you too, but I'd probably get it wrong. One thing I know for certain is it would be pretty stupid of me to argue with an expert about it. If you want to look foolish to a peanut farmer, that's a solid plan. Hey, he just described the internet in a nutshell. Dude, that was bad. Okay, so with this in mind, we're going to talk about the comet story that I wrote and grade each part based on how solidly we know it to be true. Much of the story rests on cosmic noon, the time billions of years ago when stars formed in greater numbers. Yeah, cosmic noon is based on strong, consistent evidence. We see it in other galaxies, and it's recorded in the different populations of stars in our own. So, yeah, Cosmic Noon was a thing. The idea that this comet came from that time is a bit less solid. It can fit all of the data, the composition, color, and speed, 
So based on what we know, this is the most likely scenario. But we could still find new data that makes us rethink. Consider that we know the Earth orbits the Sun rather than the other way around. And that's not subject to change. There won't be an everything you know is wrong moment. That's largely a myth. The evidence for that is like a sport grid of steel girders coming from all directions. But when it comes to things like this comet, we only have a handful of facts plus some physics. So it's still possible that we could have it completely wrong in our story. And I expect if we came back in two years and made a new story, it might be substantially different. Right now, this is the best fit to what we know. So we went with that in the story. One thing we kind of glossed over was the star it formed around. We may never know this, but we can make educated guesses. There are a lot more small stars than big ones. So statistically, a star smaller than the sun makes sense. But our study of the lowest mass stars appears to rule out the comet forming there with the properties we see. But you know, in the end, there are a lot of combinations of parent stars, disks, and places to form in that disk. Like I said, we may never know. What about the idea that 3i came from the thick disk? That's mentioned a lot in the story. Well, the object speed and trajectory point to the Milky Way's thick disk, and the cosmic noon scenario fits in well with that too, so there's a comforting consistency there. But there is a wrinkle. The comet is rich in CO2, a very volatile material. Some argue that kind of composition points to a younger, thin disk origin instead, and they could be right. The thing is, it doesn't actually rule out a thick disk origin, so at least for now, I think the thick disk in our story is still the most likely one. I see breathless claims about how fast this comet is moving. Is it really moving that fast? And your story said its speed came from the motion of the original star. How likely is that? Well, there are basically two ways for a comet to be going this fast. One is for it to have passed near to a star, which would provide a sort of slingshot boost. The other is that it had the speed from the beginning. A recent paper ran the motion backward and checked for close calls. And they didn't turn up any close calls with stars, at least for the last few millions of years. This was a test to see if it could have come from a nearby star more recently. And they didn't find any evidence for that. It's just moving too fast relative to the sun. On the other hand, stars from the thick disk do move fast. And forming around such a star explains the speed just fine. So we went with that in the story. And typical stars from the thick disk bob up and down as they orbit the galaxy, so we added that as well. For context, this comet was moving 60 kilometers per second when it arrived in our solar system. The Earth orbits the Sun at about 30 kilometers per second, so that's twice as fast. It turns out that stars near the Sun are typically moving at about 20 to 60 kilometers per second, so that's not so unusual. And the thick disk stars are the fast ones. Ah, okay. I see how that isn't a wildly high speed, and it connects nicely to the thick disk scenario. Yeah, and in the end, the cosmic noon and thick disk scenarios reinforce one another. And that's when you could be onto something. Let's address the elephant in the room. Is this alien technology? You don't shoot the messenger, but there isn't any reason to think so. The idea that this comet is alien tech comes about by a chain of multiple sloppy mistakes in reasoning. The approach taken is that of finding evidence to fit an outcome, which is limited and circular. The process is to focus on finding anything that's apparently a bit off and to do so without considering the more likely and mundane explanations. Because of the focus on the outcome, there's no attempt to find evidence contrary to the alien tech idea. This is left to the rest of the science community to do, which artificially creates an adversarial relationship, by the way. History tells us this is a poor approach to take. If your goal is to know the truth. If your goal is to know the truth, then this is an unfortunate path, because if you go looking for something, you will usually end up finding it, even if it's not real. This mistake is an open invitation to our brains to fool us. And so scientists are taught to avoid it. No one is immune to fooling themselves when they take this kind of shortcut. Richard Feynman gave an eloquent commencement address about this at Caltech. 
that has become a touchstone for many of us. Oh, now he's bringing out the big guns. Yep. He said, the first principle is that you must not fool yourself. And you are the easiest person to fool. So you have to be very careful about that. After you've not fooled yourself, it's easy not to fool other scientists. You just have to be honest in a conventional way after that. He goes on to describe in detail the various pitfalls, including how we should work not to verify, but to falsify our hypotheses. Only when we've tried to tear it down should we share it with others. That's a hard standard to live up to. But we have to try. Taking other shortcuts, like publishing on a blog without any input from others in the field, much less proper peer review, is also sort of a road to ruin. The bottom line is that to comet researchers, who've seen many comets come and go, there's no reason at all, not even the slightest hint, that there's anything about this comet that would require alien technology to explain it. Now, it is an alien comet. That's not a clickbait headline. I'm sure someone will say it is. And then it came from another star system. And that makes it very interesting. But there's no more reason to suspect it's alien technology than to suspect that satellite you saw go over your house last night was an alien spacecraft. Orbital space may be a mysterious place to some people, but to an expert satellite tracker, it's just everyday stuff. And hey, they could probably look up the satellite for you. So to summarize, we can say that on this channel, we just take the evidence as it comes and see where it takes us. History tells us this is the best path to the truth. Also, we think comets are really cool. Here, have a peanut.